It's Platt, and today we head to London. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the particular beer we have today is the London Porter. It comes to us from Fuller's Brewing. Uh, I believe I reviewed the ESB a while back. I'm not 100% sure, so I'll go ahead and give you a quick little recap on the history of Fuller's. Uh, Fuller's was founded in 1845 in Chiswick, uh, Chiswick, West London. There had been brewing on that property uh, in some form or fashion all the way back to the early 17th century. <coughs> um, the brewery that was on the property at the time had done fairly well and uh, was successful all the way up till the early 1800s. Uh, they started getting a little cash strap, times got a little tough. And in 1829, they ended up bringing in John Fuller. Uh, they brought him in to help turn things around, also to provide additional capital. Now, like a lot of partnerships, and I know a little bit about that, <coughs> things get a little stressed. And eventually, the partnership had to break up. And in 1845, John brought in his son, a gentleman named John Turner, and a gentleman named Henry Smith to form Fuller, Smith, and Turner. Now... There is still a Fuller, Smith, and Turner uh, corporate, uh, company to do today. Uh, they ran the brewery all the way up to the year 2019 when they sold the brewing division to Asahi. <clears throat> now, besides the Fuller Brewing that we're talking about today, they also sold uh, Cornish Orchard, which is a cider maker, and Dark Star Brewing. Um, Fuller, Smith, and Turner is actually a larger corporation uh, than just the brewing division. They also run roughly 380 various inns, pubs, and hotels throughout the southern England area. And I guess in 2019, they decided to split off the uh, brewing division and sell that. Uh, I'm going to soon presume with that that they don't have the three-tier system like we do here in the U.S. where you know, you have Budweiser, you have a distributor, and then you have a bar, and they all three are separate. It appears there was some vertical integration there. Uh, real quick, let's review some of the beers in their portfolio. First, the ESB that I talked about earlier. ESB stands for Extra Special Bitters. Uh, they, this is their flagship beer, probably the most popular beer. Uh, ESBs are kind of like pale ales. Uh, pub style beers, uh, probably close to a regular guy beer that they have in England. It's, they don't drink uh, the, the light beer style beers that we do here in the U.S. The, the, they're more ale than lager uh, type people. Next is 1845, a 6.3% alcohol by volume strong ale. This beer was produced for the brewery's 150th anniversary in 1995. Next is a beer called Frontier, 4.5% alcohol by volume. It is a European pale lager. And again, it's a little unusual for a British uh, brewery to produce that. The European pale lager, uh, best example is Heineken, is popular on the continent. You know, the typical green bottle, light, slightly skunky lager beer. That's more popular on the European continent. The British tend to gravitate more toward ales. Again, the ESB is closer to their quote-unquote regular guy beer. Um, again, the influence of German uh, brewing and the lager-style beer is bigger on the continent. So, uh, But uh, it appears when you're a massive company like that, again, they probably throw you know different things in the portfolio. Last but not least is beer uh, known as Red Fox. It is a Irish red ale. I'm 99.99% sure it has nothing to do with the comedian Red Fox from the old TV show Sanford and Son. If you're a little too young to ever watch that show, go back and check it out. It was pretty funny and a show that could not air today because it was not politically correct. Well, with that being said, before we try this particular beer, let's check out the stats. So today I thought I would talk about porters versus stouts. If you've watched uh, my beer reviews for a while, you know I like darker, maltier beers. But I haven't really reviewed hardly any porters. This might be the second one I've reviewed. Generally I've done more stouts. So I kind of want to talk about the dynamic porters versus stouts, which came first, you know, what have you. Uh, actually what came first was the porter style beer. The porter style beer came about in the early 
uh, 17th century. It was designed to be kind of a darker beer, a higher ABV beer, a, a bigger beer than uh, what was kind of standard at the time. And it caught on quickly with the working men of the, of the London area. This beer was a beer created in that area, um, around in and around the London metro area. Uh, the style quickly caught on. People really liked it. Again, especially the higher ABV, the bigger beer, people really started to gravitate toward that beer. Whenever you have a style that takes off, then you get the imitators, other people, uh, you know, coming in to uh, try the, you know, cr uh, to create variations of the beer. Uh, the beer itself was, a, a, like I said, again, higher ABV beer, kind of in the mid sixes, which it, it gets you kind of outside that session uh, style beer, which people were kind of a little more used to. Um, with the, uh, the, a good example of this would be the IPA. IPA became popular years ago, and all of a sudden now you got New England IPAs, high hazy IPAs, double IPAs, triple IPAs. Same thing with the porters. Now, some of those styles, some of those sub styles kind of came and went, but one that kind of came out that caught the people's eye was something known as a single stout porter. Gained some traction, people started liking it, and it got to the point where people eventually ended up dropping the porter part of the name that just became known as stouts. Now, another thing that kind of uh, tilted the balance of power from the porter to the stout was uh, thanks to a gentleman. Arthur Guinness. Now, Arthur Guinness is the guy, Guinness from Guinness Beer. He found kind of a loophole in the taxation. He was able to use unmalted barley and roasted barley instead of the traditional brown malted barley that was used for porters. He was able to use those in his stouts. They were untaxed, so he was able to save money. And, uh, that was just enough to really get people to start switching toward stouts. And in the aftermath, porters started kind of watering down their product. Porters came, went from the mid-sixes to the mid-fours. And so the combination of the two, the porter style of beer really started kind of dying off. By, by the time post-prohibition era began, you weren't finding that style here in the U.S. and There probably wasn't even a lot of it over in England at the time. Now, luckily, thanks to the craft beer revolution that hit, that started back in the 80s, the style has come back and people are starting to appreciate it again. Um, um, but, it, however, the, the stout is still uh, way ahead or, or more well-known as the porter. So, the stout is kind of the son of a porter, I guess is the best way to put it. Well, enough about the son of a porter. Let's try a porter. All right, a nice dark brown. We got a nice khaki head. Not totally opaque. I can kind of see through it, but pretty dark. Oh, plenty of malt on the nose. Let's give her a try. Oh, that's a nice beer. Nice dark malts, but not, not the almost burnt coffee notes that you kind of get in the stouts. This is a little more subtle. That's one thing I've found about porters, too, is... It's, it seems they don't go as extreme uh, darkness of the malt as a stout does. This beer tends to be a little more brown than black, I guess is a good way to put it. And so the dark malt notes are more of that chocolate in than you would get in the coffee espresso end of a stout. Real nice beer. Um... One thing about it being an ale over the lager style, like comparing this to, let's say, a Bach or a Doppelbach beer, um, to me it has a little more body. And again, the yeast play, the ale yeast plays a bigger role in the flavor profile than would a lager yeast per se. So, but this is a real good 
very drinkable beer. Uh, goes down nice and easy. Has a mild aftertaste in the back of the throat. Doesn't linger long, though. Um, I think part of the problem, <laughs> I don't want to say problem, not a problem as far as taste profile, water, I guess problem in the selling of this beer style nowadays is that Again, at one time, this was considered a big beer. This is one of those beers that you want. Yes, this is a big beer. The porter of today, though, that's kind of come through the whole process, again, is, is mid-fours to fives. Uh, this is uh, like mid-five ABV range. And again, if you're drinking big, dark beers, you kind of want something a little higher, something a little more. Let's get in the sexes. Let's get in the sevens. Let's... And that's not this. This is, um, you know, again, more in Bacchish range as far as ABV and stuff. So, you know, the stout drinker, you know, we've got so many now 10 and 11% stouts out there that I think the dark beer guy has gravitated to that point. And then, of course, the light beer guys aren't touching this. So Porter's kind of fall in a weird spot as far as, I guess, the flavor bell curve of beers, for lack of a better term. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it'll let YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you would like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.